that. <laughs> we are studying uh, a series in prophecy. Prophecy is actually understanding what the Bible says is going to happen in the future. One third of the Bible was written in a prophetic language when it was written, it was um, future. And so you'd have to tear out major portions of your Bible if you did not believe in studying prophecy. So what we're going to do in this series, we're going to take different segments of prophecy and look at them. Last week we talked about the blessed hope. That's the, the rapture of the church when Christ is going to catch uh, up the bride to meet him in the air. And tonight we're going to look at a, a major prophetic passage in the Bible and it's called the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse. And the reason it's called the Olivet Discourse is because Jesus was on the Mount of Olives with his disciples and uh, he began to teach them about future events. And you'll find that in Matthew 24, 25. That's where we'll go tonight. It's also found in Mark chapter 13. And then it's also found in Luke chapter 21. And so you'll, you'll find in all three of those passages uh, the basic uh, synopsis of what he taught on that uh, Mount of Olives. So I want to begin uh, by uh, starting reading some out of uh, chapter 24 because Jesus is the one who gave this teaching and he said these are things that are going to come to pass and he primarily focused on the period we know as the tribulation period. That's the period when the judgment of God is poured out on this earth. So we're going to break this chapter down into quite a number of segments and uh, might go a little longer than I normally do, but I'm taking back some I've given you in the past, okay? So let's begin with chapter 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and he departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of of thy coming and of the end of the world. So there are some questions that prompted the discourse. And you find that in the first three verses. These are some questions that prompted <coughs> Jesus to give this teaching. And so the setting for the discourse is found in the last part of chapter 23. And notice, if you will, where he's reading, I mean, he's uh, uh, teaching Jerusalem about the fact that they're going to be uh, ignored or overlooked by God for a while as he leaves them because of their rejection of him. Listen as I read verse 37 through 39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me again till you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So he's saying, I'm backing away. You're not going to see me again until you're going to see me at the second coming when I come in power and great glory. So Jesus is indicating because Jerusalem and Israel had rejected him as Messiah, God is turning from them. And we pointed out last week, he's taken out of the Gentiles a people for his name. It's called the church. And we're in the church age, which now has lasted almost 2,000 years. And uh, people are being saved from all nations now, coming to make up the bride of Christ. Now, when they came out of the temple, the disciples said, Master... Isn't that a magnificent temple? Look at those huge stones. Look at how wonderful it looks. And you see, it was not quite complete yet. And Herod had been re re refurbishing the temple, and they were so impressed uh, that they pointed it out. And here's what he said. He said, well, let me tell you something. There'll come a time that not one of these stones will be left on another. Every bit of it will be laid flat. In 70 A.D., Titus, the Roman emperor, came and he 
massacred the Jews, and the temple was completely brought to the ground. So that was what he said would happen. And they said, what? Well, tell us something. I mean, they asked him three questions which prompted the Olivet Discourse. Number one is when shall these things happen? When is this going to happen? Number two, what's the sign of thy coming? Which means they knew he was going away and coming back. What's the sign of your coming? And then, number three, what is the sign that the world is about to come to an end? So those are the three questions that prompted the Olivet Discourse. Then as we begin to get into the discourse itself, I want you to notice the warnings that permeate the discourse. There's one particular warning that's repeated, and Jesus continually said, you better be careful. Now notice what he's saying. Verse 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So he warned them, you better be careful because there are going to be deceivers coming that will lead you astray. Drop down, if you will, to verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And then, if you will, drop down to verse 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible... They shall deceive the very elect. Well, what's one of the basic names of Satan? That old deceiver. If you go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says that he who has deceived the nations led them astray. And then in chapter 20, verses 20, excuse me, chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, when he was cast into the lake of fire, that he shall deceive the nations no more. One of Satan's primary tools, and you need to understand this because he's got a lot of people working for him, is deception. So if you think you're going to notice the devil when he comes to you in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork, you've got another thought coming. He's going to come as an angel of light. He's going to look like somebody good and special. And if you don't have spiritual discernment and you don't understand what's being said and especially how it works up against the truth of the Bible, you'll be deceived. Our world is being deceived today. There are people today who wouldn't know the truth if they ran into it because they're so deceived about what is going on. Matter of fact, in verse 24, it says that they will be able to do great signs and wonders. So if you're willing to follow somebody because he can pull off a special trick, you're going to be deceived. Uh, when you read in the book of the Revelation what the Antichrist is going to do and uh, the way he's going to have many signs and wonders that's going to astound the people, he is going to be considered one of the greatest guys who ever showed up on this earth because people love to hear him talk and look at what he can do and they're going to follow him like a pied piper. Only those who know the truth of the Word of God and who are led by the Spirit of God will be able to see deception. As a matter of fact, he said they're going to be so cunning in their deception that if it was possible, they could deceive the very elect of God. Those people who know God and serve Him. So as we walk down through this discourse, the, th the third thing I want to point out to you is the beginning of birth pains. This is verses 6 through 8. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And the phrase beginning of sorrows literally is translated birth pains. So, when we are advancing on this earth toward the tribulation, it's described in nature as a woman about to have a baby. 
And there's two things that become very evident when a woman is about to approach her due date is that she's going to start having pain. And as she gets closer to delivery, what happens? It increases in frequency, it increases in intensity. Can you understand that with me? So what he's saying is, these are birth pains. When you see all these different things, wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, then you need to know that it may be the sign of his coming, especially if they get more intense and more frequent. You cannot look at the natural disasters across this world and, and say uh, everything's all right in nature. You cannot. Uh, the, the, the things of nature are unpredictable, and you never know what's going to happen. The tsunamis and the earthquakes and the tornadoes and the hurricanes and the floods and the forest fires, you just keep going. You know what's happened in America? We put our money in bags with holes in it. And it's because we've turned away from God. And if we turn back to God, I believe we'd see a reversal in this, but I'm not sure that's going to happen. The next thing I want you to notice in this chapter is hatred for Jews and Christians. It's predicted, verses 9 and 10. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall uh, many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Can anybody here tonight say there's not a global hatred for the Jewish nation? Can anybody say that? You know, there's somewhere around 5,000 people in the nation of Israel. What is it in Tennessee? Seven? Between seven and eight now? Million people? Did I say thousand? Yeah, million. Million. Uh, why? Why is this little nation of people known as the Jews so hated? You see, you can look at the local events, but I think you ought to also back up and understand the bigger picture. There's been a war going on between Satan and God from the beginning, and God chose this people, and through this people, He gave us our Bible, He gave us our morality, and He gave us our Savior, and Satan hates the Jews. But also, you remember when they rejected Jesus? We don't want Him. We don't have any other king but Caesar. And they said, well, what are we going to do with Jesus? He said, let his blood be on us and on our kids. And is that the case? And they have been dispersed around the globe and been persecuted. I mean, and I don't understand it. Why is there such a hatred? I, I think that there's a spiritual dimension uh, because, you see, Satan knows some things too. God's fixed to go back and bring this nation back into the forefront, and it's going to become a blessing to the whole world when Christ comes to rule. We'll talk about that when we talk about His millennial reign. It says they will be hated of all nations. And then, why are Christians hated? It's for Jesus' sake. You should be hated of all nations for my name's sake. You can talk about God all day long, but you better leave Jesus out of it. Have you noticed that in the public arena? Yes. Jesus is a very unpopular. He is divisive. He is uh, creating uh, a narrow-minded, bigoted crowd. That's who we are in the eyes of many people because we say Jesus is our only Savior. And they say that's arrogance. They say that's bigot. That's narrow-minded and so unloving to all the other people who worship Buddha and Muhammad and all the others. And so we're hated. Well, one of the things that you need to realize, if you're going to really be a sold-out Christian, you will have persecution in one form or another. It's just going to come at work or some other place. But I'll tell you, there's one other factor that 
that's entered into this conversation, and that is, do you know what's really holding back this world from going all out with the devil? It is the influence of the church empowered by the Holy Spirit. You need to know a passage of Scripture. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I want to read verses 7 and 8. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. This is talking about the Antichrist. For the mystery of iniquity is, does already work. Only he who now lets, and the word in the old King James, let, really means hinder. So he who now hinders will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, and that really should be wicked one, it's talking about the Antichrist, then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So from this passage, somebody is keeping the Antichrist from being revealed and doing his dirty work. From really taking over. What is it? It's you and I, through the person of the Holy Spirit, restraining. We are a light to our world and salt. And we are restraining the corruption. Because when the church goes out at the rapture, there's going to be a celebration. Those weird old buddy duddies are gone. We can party all we want to now. Nobody will tell us it's not right. So there's hatred for Christians and Jews. And more Christians are being killed today than ever before in history. So while America is not experiencing any real significant persecution, maybe a little bit of a laughter or mockery or something, but in other countries, more Christians are being killed than in any other time in history. Number five. There's a warning against false prophets and false Christ. Look at verse five. For many shall come in my name, saying, I Christ, but they'll deceive many. Look at verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise. Look at verse 23 through 28. If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, that shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he, he is in the secret chamber, believe it not. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there shall the eagles be gathered together. I got news for you. You cannot believe everything you hear on television. You cannot even believe everything you read on the internet. There are a lot of weirdos out there claiming to be false Christ, claiming to be prophets from God. You have the Word of God. And the Bible says the way you tell whether or not a man or a woman is speaking for God is are they teaching according to the book. And if they're not sticking with the Word of God, they're false. You don't have to wonder or worry. Just say, no, he's a false prophet because he's contradicting what the Word of God teaches. Well, uh, I want you to notice in that last phrase down there it says, now here's something you need to know. When I come, it's going to be like the lightning that comes from the east and the west is going to cover the sky at once. Now here's something Jesus is going to be able to do that you won't be able to explain. And that is when he comes, he's going to be here all at once, everywhere. It's not like, well, he's in New York, he'll be here by Sunday. No. He is here. And, and look at verse 28. He said, now, where the uh, carcass is, there were the eagles. That word probably would be better translated as vultures. Wherever the carcass is, that's where you're going to see the vultures uh, roaming. Did you know there is an unusual breed of vultures that are growing in the Middle East? Huge monsters. And they're in great numbers. Because when you read the book of the Revelation at the Battle of Armageddon, 
Uh, it says that there, when, when, when that army is going to be defeated, it says their flesh will be the food of the birds. Do you see the nations circling Jerusalem? The vultures are circling. It means that the end is almost at hand. What Jesus told us about false prophets is this. He said this in Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Watch out for false prophets and here's how you can tell whether they're false. You can tell by their fruit. You don't go get a grape off of a thorn bush. You don't get a pear off of a bramble bush. By their fruit you shall know them. What, what he says is you can be fruit inspectors. That's not judging. You're fruit inspectors, right? In other words, hey, anybody living like that, acting like that, can't be of God. Because you can see by their fruit. So you watch out for those who come up with something you find like a new gospel. There's only one, and it's a good old gospel. And so we need to make sure that nobody comes to lead us astray. Number six. We're walking down through the Olivet Discourse and things that Jesus said would happen. There will be moral decay which perverts society. Verses 12 and 13. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Can I ask you a question? Is the world getting better? Folks, what would your granddaddy say if he was here? He wouldn't believe it. And you know, when I was young, I thought it was bad, but now it's in overdrive. And that's what 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 says, And evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. There's more perversion, more corruption, more crookedness in this world than ever before. And so Jesus said, iniquity is going to abound. It's going 